In this video, we're going to look at fully developed pipe flow and look at the energy balance in pipes that are experiencing both fully developed flow and fully developed temperature profiles. We'll look at the case of constant heat flux, and then we'll look at the case of constant surface temperature, which will bring us to the concept of the log mean temperature difference. I'll then look at a couple of the available correlations for the Nusselt number as a function of the diameter of our pipe or the length scale of our internal flow channel. And finally, we'll consider what happens when we have additional resistances added to our systems. So we've seen already the, fully de uh, the developing flow profiles, where the flow comes from a plug flow and develops to a fully developed flow, which in the case of a laminar flow is this parabola or paraboloid. And we see the boundary there that's developed in that region where the flow is sensing the presence of the no-slip condition on the walls. We know that we have the same thing in the thermal profiles, where the temperature profile is adjusting <coughs> from the constant temperature at the inlet to the constant surface or the different surface temperature compared to the interior temperature. And we see the development of a thermal boundary there. And if we have a constant surface temperature or a constant heat flux, we will achieve a different fully developed thermal profile. We know that we can calculate the energy balance on that whole system, the total thermal energy that is transferred to the fluid from outside if the surface temperature is hotter than the interior temperature is given by the mass flow rate times the heat capacity of the fluid times the mixed mean temperature at the outlet minus the mixed mean temperature at the inlet. Remember what the mixed mean temperature means is if we perfectly mix uh, this given profile, that's the temperature that it would, that the single, that's the single temperature that it would be if that fluid at that one cross section were perfectly mixed. We saw that we, if we achieve a fully developed temperature profile, of course the temperature profile is still changing as we're always adding energy to this. If the surface temperature is hotter than the interior temperature or vice versa, if surface temperature is cooler, we're always losing energy. But that a fully developed temperature profile means that the non-dimensional temperature profile is not changing with distance once we reach that, that um, fully developed condition. So of course the non-dimensional temperature profile is the the change in the non-dimensional temperature profile with respect to x is equal to zero, and the definition of our Nusselt number is that it is the non-dimensional temperature gradient at the wall. If the non-dimensional temperature gradient is not changing with x, then the non-dimensional temperature gradient at the wall is not changing with x, and therefore the Nusselt number is not a function of x. Our Nusselt number is going to be a constant everywhere that we're in the fully developed flow regime. Now, since our Nusselt number, pardon me, since our Nusselt number is equal to, that's Nusselt number with respect to x, is equal to hx over k, and the Nusselt number is a constant, then of course my convection coefficient is going to decrease, it's going to be inversely related to x. And we'll see that that convection coefficient decreases with distance along the channel. Now, we saw that if we have a constant surface temperature, we get this logarithmic increase of the mixed mean temperature on the inside as it exponentially approaches that surface temperature, which is a constant. We're going to focus on the fully developed region and look at the energy balance. But first, let's look at the case of a constant heat flux. When we have a constant heat flux, a constant <coughs> Q prime prime entering our system, uh, it's a much simpler system to analyze. Once we reach the fully developed condition, we have a constant difference between the mixed mean temperature and the surface temperature because we're adding a constant amount of, of energy at every point, and the mixed mean temperature has to be increasing linearly. Let's look at that in more detail. If we consider a small control volume where we have an element, differential element dq entering our small control volume of length dx, then that dq, of course, is equal to that constant heat flux q double prime times the perimeter of my cross section times dx the surface area for that heat transfer PDX. Of course, we can relate that to Newton's law of cooling, and we can say that's equal to a convection coefficient times my surface temperature, which now is changing with X because the heat flux is constant, minus my mixed mean temperature, which is also changing with X, such that the difference is always the same, times the area. I know that this differential, thinking about the, the, the fluid being heated inside the pipe, is equal to the mass flow rate times the specific heat of the fluid, times the temperature difference coming in and out of here. That's the, what this energy has to be considering the fluid. And if we consider the heat transfer from the outside, we can now uh, compare these two relations. But of course, we can immediately integrate uh, for our mixed mean temperature as a function of x. Of course, dt dx in combining these equations is equal to q double prime p over m dot cp. We can integrate that immediately to get our temperature distribution. The mixed mean temperature is going to be a linear increase from the mixed mean temperature at the inlet. Uh, by adding q prime prime everywhere times the area 
over m dot cp. And so we can calculate easily what this linear increase in the mixed mean temperature is in our fully developed uh, temperature region for a constant heat flux boundary condition. The constant surface temperature is a little bit more complicated to analyze, and that's because, of course, our temperature is now constant, but our mixed mean temperature is going to experience this exponential decay, and if we were at an infinite length, the mixed mean temperature would reach that surface temperature and there'd be no more heat transfer. So if we look again at our differential control volume of extent dx, we have the exact same situation up here. We just have a different way that Tm is changing. So the differential heat transfer into our fluid is Q double prime P dx, and of course Q double prime is not a constant. The driving force for that heat transfer is changing as the mixed mean temperature gets closer and closer to the surface temperature. So this is changing, and we can still look at it from the point of view of the fluid here, and of course the that same dq has to be equal to the heat capacity of the fluid, the mass flow rate times the specific heat, times the difference in temperature across our little control volume. Now if we equate these two, we now have this expression here, except that we don't have the nice constant anymore, so this is a little more, um, a little more complicated. So let's look at our expression as we have it here. Now we want to solve for the local temperature along our pipe. We've sketched it here. We want to solve for what exactly that is. And so we'll do much like we've done in other instances. We have a differential of this mixed mean temperature with respect to x, and we have this difference over here. So let's introduce something like our excess temperature. Let's let theta be equal to everywhere b, the constant surface temperature minus the local mixed mean temperature. So theta is always this difference right here. And now it's slightly different than our excess temperature because we have put the surface temperature minus the mixed mean temperature. So if we take the differential of theta, this is a constant, it'll be zero, and we'll be left with d theta being minus Tm, simply because of the order we've chosen to define theta in. Nonetheless, we can simplify the equation then. We have d theta dx is equal to minus Pm dot Cp h theta, and now we're ready to separate the variables and integrate. So d theta over theta is equal to this expression which only has x on the other side, constants, and my x on the other side. And I can integrate then from theta at the inlet, theta i, to theta at x, any position that I have here, of d theta over theta, is minus p over mcp, the constants, times the integral from 0 to x of h dx. Now, of course, I don't really need to do this because we've already argued from the fully developed temperature condition that h, the Neusselt number, has to be a constant, and accordingly h has to be a constant. Now we can expand this term by simply multiplying and dividing by x. If I multiply by x, I get an x up here. And now I have here the definition of the average convection coefficient from the inlet at 0 to my any point x. 1 over x times the integral from 0 to x of h dx is by definition my average convection coefficient up to that point. And so I have this expression here, and no surprise, we see that we do have an exponential decay in this driving force for heat transfer that we've called theta. Of course, I can put that back into uh, dimensional terms in terms of our temperature, simply by substituting the definition of theta back in, and we see that the logarithm of that constant surface temperature minus the local mixed mean temperature over the surface temperature minus the mixed mean temperature at the inlet is equal to this expression here. We can take exponentials of that, and we now have the means to solve for Tm of x, our mixed mean temperature at any point in our pipe flow. We also know that the total heat transfer into our pipe, if we look at the whole pipe, from the inlet to the outlet, is equal to the heat capacity of that flow, m dot, times the specific heat of the fluid, times the mixed mean temperature at the outlet, minus the mixed mean temperature at the inlet. There's no reason that we can't put a Ts minus Tmo here, and subtract from it a Ts minus Tmi, then the Ts's that we introduced will cancel each other out, because one's positive and one's negative. And this, so this is identical to saying that we have the heat capacity of the fluid, m dot Cp, times this theta i, theta at the inlet, the difference between the surface temperature and the mixed mean temperature at the inlet minus the difference of the surface temperature and the mixed mean temperature at the outlet. And of course, if I look at the entire pipe of a length L, then I simply replace that x with an L, and I have my expression for the entire heat transfer through that whole pipe, and it's the inlet and the outlet that we are talking about, where our x is, of course, L, the full length. So if I go back to my uh, theta form, I have the logarithm of theta o over theta i is equal to this expression here. I've taken the ln of either side of this expression and I put back theta from this definition here is all I've done. And now I can solve for this m dot cp, which I can substitute into this expression here and get an equation for the total heat transfer to that fluid. So m dot cp, the heat capacity of the fluid, is equal to this expression here. 
and I can substitute that in to my expression for Q. It's starting to look a lot like Newton's law of cooling. Let's remember that P times L is our surface area for heat transfer. So let's put it out as an AS to make it look a little bit more like Newton's law of cooling. And now I don't like this negative because it doesn't appear in Newton's law of cooling. So let's flip these temperatures here and get rid of that negative. And now I have something that looks very, very much like Newton's law of cooling. I have a convection coefficient, an average convection coefficient, times the surface area for heat transfer, times this temperature difference, except that it's the differences have to be expressed this way where it's the surface temperature minus the mixed mean temperature, or, always remember, that is, at any location in my pipe, my driving force for the heat transfer at that location. And so if I replace this quantity here with a definition of delta T log mean, so I have the temperature difference between the wall and the, f and the mixed mean temperature at the outlet minus the temperature difference between the, mix between the surface temperature and the mixed mean temperature at the inlet, divided by the logarithm of these two same quantities. And that, by definition, is the log mean temperature difference. It is a reflection of the fact that our driving force is decreasing with distance along our pipe because the mixed mean temperature is getting closer and closer to our surface temperature. So this driving force is getting smaller and smaller. And you can see from this derivation that this is the correct form of a temperature difference to express Newton's law of cooling in in order to calculate the heat transfer in the system. So now we have a way of calculating the total heat transfer from our heated uh, wall surface to our flow. And of course, we had an expression already to calculate for that mixed mean temperature at any location in that pipe if we wish to know what that is at any point or at the outlet. As is often the case, we want to solve the outlet temperature for a given length of pipe. We'll need those average convection coefficients, and of course, we'll get those by looking at correlations. Now, we expect from looking at what we saw before that the, the Nusselt number is going to be a constant in internal flows. And well, that is exactly what we see. For laminar fully developed flow, it depends on the boundary condition. When we have a constant surface temperature, the Nusselt number is simply a constant of 3.66. If the heat flux is constant, it's 4.36. You can go look at other situations where perhaps it's a square channel that will change these values, or a rectangular channel, or perhaps it's a channel where heat transfer, a square channel where heat transfer is only happening on one of the walls. That will again change these values, and you can look up appropriate values for your particular problem. In a turbulent flow, it still looks like our regular uh, function here, uh, a, core, a function of the form Reynolds number times the Prandtl number. But of course, the Reynolds number is constant in our flow if our, if our properties are constant, and we use the average properties for our pipe, we'll get a constant Reynolds number from the inlet to the outlet. Material properties aren't changing, the velocity isn't changing by conservation of mass, and so this is a constant. And so even though this changes with Reynolds number, it still gives us a single value of the Nusselt number for a particular flow situation. Again, there are other correlations you can look up and use for your appropriate situation. Now what happens if we have additional resistances? What if it's not just the pipe? Before we drew the pipe here, now what if we add a layer of insulation to this pipe? Or what if we want to consider the heat transfer through the thickness of the pipe wall? Perhaps if it's not a metal pipe and that conductivity isn't very high, we might be concerned about that. More appropriately, we'd be concerned about it when there's insulation. And let's say we have a constant, not a constant surface temperature, but a constant ambient temperature and a convection coefficient on the outside that maybe we've calculated by calculating for the, the, the flow over a cylinder and we know the wind speed, etc. So perhaps all the stuff we did in the previous week will give us the means to calculate this H out. We know the ambient temperature T infinity. How do we handle this? We have our expressions here. We know we can use the log mean temperature difference to calculate the total heat transfer rate. But of course, we can simply replace our average convection coefficient with our overall heat transfer coefficient. And we can calculate that overall heat transfer rate as it's simply the inverse of the total area specific resistance. So we have a resistance network where we have a convection coefficient on the inside. We go through, we go through from T M at any given location. We go through our convection resistance on the inside. We see the surface temperature there. We have a conduction resistance through that insulation. And then we have a convection resistance on the outside. And of course, this one is T over K. And that gives us our total resistance. We can take the inverse of that, and that's our overall heat transfer coefficient. So all we need to do is change the H bar that appeared in our expressions with this U bar, and we can account for this situation here. And we have always our expression to calculate a for that makes mean temperature at any location. Again, all we've done is replaced the overall heat transfer coefficient for the H bar that we had. So now our constant surface temperature 
is our ambient temperature on the outside. We have these convection processes and these convection processes to our mixed mean temperature on the inside, which we can calculate at any point, as well as the total heat transfer using our log mean temperature difference.